Well, Professor Kirk Larson is an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University. He's also assistant director of academic programs and research here. He previously taught at the University of Texas, Austin, and at the George Washington University. His publications include Traditions, Treaties, and Trade, Qing Imperialism, and Chosong Korea, 1850 to 1910. He has also published, presented, and commented on a variety of contemporary issues involving North Korea, nationalism, uh, and elections in South Korea, as well as Sino-Korean relations. He's appeared on a wide range of networks, including ABC, MSNBC, Voice of America, Canadian Broadcast System, and Al Jazeera. He received his PhD, uh, PhD in history from Harvard University. Uh, the title for Professor Larson's presentation today is Getting North Korea Wrong, Hackers, Defectors, and Making Sense of the DPRK. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kirk Larson. Thank you, Corey, for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's always a pleasure to be able to opine on things that I'm interested in. And uh, I guess if it's North Korea, some other people are interested too, so that's a good thing. Uh, I want to start out with a, some, some photos of what has become sort of a political ritual in uh, the United States, United States, South Korean relations. Oops. I said click twice, and I did. Uh, and that is that whenever an American president visits our treaty ally, South Korea, uh, they seem to be required to go up to the DMZ uh, be accompanied by soldiers and peer across the DMZ through binoculars into the mysterious north. What exactly they're expecting to see uh, when they look through this is, is not entirely clear to me, but, but it has become something of a ritual. So here's President Obama peering into the mysterious north. Uh, here is George W. Bush doing the same, <coughs> Bill Clinton, <laughs> Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so it goes. Uh, almost as old and venerable as this particular ritualistic tradition is the tradition of, of uh, people that want to have a little fun or, or critics of, of uh, having some fun with Photoshop and saying not only do our presidents peer across the DMZ into the mysterious north with binoculars, sometimes the lens caps aren't on, or the lens caps are on, excuse me. And so here's Bill Clinton looking at positively nothing. Uh, here's George W. Bush doing the same thing. Uh, I haven't been able to find one of Photoshop with Obama, but the, the, the sort of weird color of the lenses gives the same sort of impression. Is he really seeing anything is, is sort of the question. Now, the people that are doing this, of course, are, are, are usually making a partisan political point or having a little fun, but, but I think it's an interesting metaphor for a larger process of, you know, what do we really see when we look at North Korea or we think we're looking at North Korea? What do we really understand? Do we, do we see anything at all or do we simply replace what we think we're seeing with what we expect to see? Uh, and so when we think about uh, ways in which North Korea has been in the media of late, uh, whether we're talking about the Sony hacking scandal and, and alleged North Korean complicity there, or the recent release of a United Nations human rights report, which, which details uh, in, in, in great de detail human rights abuses in, in uh, the DPRK, uh, the, these sorts of questions come to mind. Uh, but, but as I was thinking about how best to sort of approach this, uh, I'm, I'm also struck by the fact that uh, Probably dwarfing, at, le at least recently, uh, the number of reports on these particular things is, is are, are the reports of the fact that uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is sporting a new haircut. And in fact, I googled Kim Jong-un new haircut this morning, and then there are 2,070,000 hits on Google about that very important issue. Uh, which, which leads me to, to uh, make a couple of, of general observations about what I want to do here today, and, and that is really focus less on what actually is going on in North Korea and more on how we think we understand North Korea or don't understand North Korea. Uh, and in doing so, I'm going to be, uh, um, I, I don't want to give any sort of impression that these are the definitive conclusions, uh, rather this is a starting point for consideration and conversation. I uh, also want to note that I'm going to be a little bit critical of, of some of the ways in which uh, various groups, intelligence, uh, experts, media have, have tried to make sense of North Korea. But here, too, uh, fully confess uh, some, some uh, complicity, at least some small part, in, in this because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of the story to a, a, a very small extent. And so this will uh, take on the, the uh, appearance of something of, of a confessional, as you'll see. So what I want to do is just, again, give you some examples of how various uh, groups of people that are interested in trying to make sense of North Korea haven't really done a very good job. Uh, they've gotten North Korea wrong. Uh, and, and, and then uh, end with, with some discussions of how this might influence how we understand uh, contemporary events like the Sony hacking, like, like uh, North Korean human rights, and particularly defector testimony in, in, in telling us about North Korean human rights. And then if time permits, I want to, to uh, finish with sort of a, a provocative call to maybe, maybe we should normalize North Korea. Maybe we shouldn't regard North Korea as this, this uniquely different place and people 
uh, but, but rather see ways in which perhaps we, we have uh, some similarities more than, than the perhaps we'd care to uh, admit or confess. Uh, and so my major contention here is that uh, more often than we care to admit, and perhaps even more often than not, we get North Korea wrong. Uh, that, that, that because of our preconceptions, because of our cognitive biases, and because it's really hard to figure out what's actually going on in North Korea, we, we, we don't get the full story, we don't get the complete story. In many cases, we don't get the right story. What do I mean? Well, let's start with one group of people that are in, intensely interested in what's going on in North Korea, and that, that's our intelligence services, the people whose job it is to, to understand the capacities, uh, but even more than that, the intentions of, of, of various nations across the world, and, and, and predict them with, with, with some degree of, of uh, reliability. Uh, and this goes back to the very beginning of, of when they first came into being in North Korea. And, and this venerable tradition of gazing, peering across the DMZ is an old one, too. Uh, here's John Foster Dulles at the 38th parallel. It wasn't the DMZ yet. Uh, but, but on June 19, 1950, peering across into North Korea and wondering, what's going on over there? Uh, whatever he thought he saw, uh, he certainly didn't see, didn't report on seeing uh, massive North Korean troop mobilizations and preparations for the Korean War, which broke out six days later. Um, and most of his intelligence services, or American intelligence services more broadly, were, were in the same boat, not, not expecting, not predicting the outbreak of the Korean War. Now, to be sure, there were some individual intelligence reports that, that, that noted troop movements, other signs of mobilizations that warned about impending possible conflict. Uh, but these were generally lost in the broad chatter that, that characterizes intelligence gathering. And it's safe to say that, that both the South Korean government and its military and the American government's military were completely caught by surprise when the, North, when the Korean War began on June 25, 1950, completely unprepared. Uh, a, a case where, where you can't argue anything else but American intelligence got it wrong. You know, they, they, they weren't ready. Then when the war began, uh, in, intelligence and, and media and, and public figures alike all fell into the, what would become increasingly a Cold War assumption that, that, that uh, the Korean War was the product of Soviet machinations. It was Stalin and the Soviets pulling the strings, forcing their unwitting, perhaps even unwilling, North Korean pawns to do their dirty work in Asia as is depicted by this uh, American news magazine that has this hulking Soviet soldier sending the little North Korean partisan off to, to, to war. Uh, we know now, because of uh, released archival material from the Soviet Union and other places, that, that actually the opposite is true, that, that Kim Il-sung and the North Koreans were the tail that wagged the Soviet dog, and that the Korean War was, was really a Korean War, uh, sparked first and foremost by, by the desire of Korean leaders rather than, than, than the Soviets. But at the time, we didn't know it, and we got it wrong. Then, as UN forces raced north across the 38th parallel and approached, approached the Yalu River and were warned in public by the Chinese government that the PRC will enter in force if this continues, uh, once again, American intelligence completely dismissed this possibility. Uh, MacArthur, the, the, the field commander, said he knows the Asian mind. There's no way the Chinese will ever do this. Uh, other, uh, other commanders and other intelligence officials agreed. And then even when they started getting reports of, hey, you know, we're actually encountering Chinese soldiers here in North Korea. We've captured them. They're not Korean. They're Chinese. What's going on here? Uh, this gives rise to one of my favorite quotations from the Korean War that comes from Walton Walker, one of the commanders on the ground. We should not assume that Chinese communists are committed in force. After all, a lot of Mexicans live in Texas. <laughs> How wrong can you be? And the, the uh, dramatic battlefield setbacks of, of late 1950, early 1951 are testament to, to the, the, the consequences of getting it wrong. Uh, one last case from the Korean War. Uh, the United States, spearheaded by Curtis LeMay, firmly believed that strategic bombing, bombing of North Korean cities, towns, and villages, and military installations, and uh, factories, and everything else, would help bring about the end of the war by basically convincing the North Koreans that, that there's no other option but to surrender. LeMay, of course, is the architect of the American terror bombing in World War II against Japan, and he continued this in, uh, during the Korean War uh, from, from uh, 1950 to 1953. Uh, and, the, and the destruction was indeed immense, uh, whether it's the port city of Wonsan or whether it's the, the, the capital city of Pyongyang. Uh, every major uh, North Korean uh, city of consequence was, was uh, heavily damaged, if not leveled. Uh, but in the end, it did not convince the North Koreans to give up. Rather, they simply relocated factories and cities underground and kept on fighting. And, and, and in reality, the, the only thing that, that led to the end of the war was, was, was less the destruction caused by the bombing and more uh, large geopolitical changes like the death of Stalin or the election of Eisenhower and other, uh, other factors. Uh, but, but again, we, we, we only knew this later. Uh, unfortunately, what this bombing did do was allow the North Koreans to create a narrative of victimization where the greatest power on the earth rained death from the sky and tried to kill us all. They, they bombed cities, they bombed towns, they bombed hospitals, they bombed homes, they bombed schools. Uh, they tried to kill us all, and we wouldn't mind uh, seeing the shoe on the other foot someday. Uh, the, the, and, and you start to get a sense of where the roots of North Korean animosity towards the United States come from. 
Well, we might say this is all ancient history. Surely our intelligence services has gotten better since then. Sadly, uh, Donald Gregg, a longtime CIA official and later uh, U.S. ambassador to South Korea, has characterized North Korea as, quote, the longest running intelligence failure in the history of U.S. espionage, uh, that, that we haven't gotten much better since, uh, especially during the Cold War, but, but arguably even, even, even more recently. Now, I would, in my own humble opinion, say that, that actually our, our intelligence service has gotten a little bit better in the last 15 years. Uh, they are starting to pay more attention to actual Korean language sources, uh, and, and uh, their track record is, is, is improving. But even in recent uh, history of recent diplomatic interactions between Korea and the United States, there are some amazing failures. Uh, for example, in 2000, U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright visited Pyongyang and had uh, several meetings with then North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. And she came back and expressed openly and frankly her surprise, pleasant, I guess, uh, surprise that uh, she could actually carry on a conversation with him, that, that he was actually a normal guy that could talk and that, that uh, that seemed to understand what was going on around him, both in, his, in, in terms of his immediate surroundings, but also world affairs. And then that would actually could be a very uh, interesting and, and congenial and gracious host. Now, why was this a surprise to her? Well, she was, according to her own admission. Uh, she said, we had some very peculiar information about Kim Jong-il, that he was a recluse. I think delusional was a word that was actually used. Uh, the, this idea that you know, intelligence services were telling her that, that, that the leader of North Korea is a crazy man and don't expect to have any meaningful conversations with him. And she came away, you know, pleasantly surprised. Wait, he's, he's actually a real person, maybe not so crazy. Uh, interesting, an interesting aside, I, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with a former CIA official who worked on, on North Korean intelligence uh, and asked him about this very thing. I said, what were you guys thinking, telling, telling her that, that Kim Jong-il's a crazy man? And he said, oh, it wasn't us. It was, it was some other branch of intelligence, you know. Not going to point fingers, but it was, wasn't us. Um, typical reply, I guess. So in addition to intelligence, I have to say that uh, if, if you look at the array of so-called North Korean experts, uh, you, in many cases you have the, the same issues and problems. Uh, that, that you have people that uh, because of their own interests, because of their disciplinary training, or because of, of other things, uh, have, have some claim to know something about North Korea, uh, and therefore appear in reports, appear in media as, as uh, opining and having, having something to say that that's actually backed up. Um, I, I have to say, and here's where the confessional comes in, I, I know a little bit of what I speak because I, I was one of these guys. Um, when I first moved to Washington, D.C. and started teaching at, at George Washington University, I, I discovered very quickly that my office phone started ringing with calls from media and other people saying, what do you think about the latest thing happening in North Korea? And my initial reaction was, well, I'm an historian. I don't really know that much about contemporary affairs. Uh, why don't you call someone else and find a real expert? Uh, but then I realized as I started paying attention to some of the media reports and the experts that appeared on there that, that I think I actually do know as much as these guys, if not more. Uh, if nothing else, I know a bit more about the cultural and historical background for, for, for why these things are taking place. And if nothing more, I can actually pronounce the names of the leaders correctly, uh, uh, unlike some of these people you know, appearing on the media. And so I, I said, why not dip my toe in the waters? And, 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 and I quickly discovered that basically all it takes to be a North Korea expert is to one, say you are, two, answer reporters' phone calls, and three, live in the 202 area code. Uh, as long as you do that, you're good. Uh, and, and, and this is not to malign anyone that does this and, and say that therefore none of them know anything they're talking about, but I do somewhat feel like Groucho Marx has said, you know, I wouldn't really want to be a member of any club that would allow me to be a member of. Uh, and, and, and there it goes, and, 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 and so it goes. Uh, and, and I will note that the 202 area code actually is pretty critical because when I moved from George Washington to here, suddenly my uh, appearances in the media went way, way down. And I don't think my expertise diminished in any way. It was just simply the fact that I'm, I'm no longer local, I'm no longer available. Uh, I will also note that, that while I, I, in my own defense, I, I tried at every turn to give historical background and context. I tried to reinforce the, the uh, contingent nature about our knowledge about North Korea, the fact that we don't know nearly as much as we, as we think we know. I tried to introduce nuance and competing uh, opinions and interpretations and so on, and found time and time again that, that all of these things disappeared on the cutting room floor, and there was just the one lurid quote quotation that, that makes it in, in, into the copy. Uh, and then even in longer uh, uh, mediums like radio interviews that allow you to explore this, uh, the takeaway of most viewers wasn't that there is a lot of uncertainty about North Korea that we often don't know nearly as much as we think we know, that there's contingency, that there's caveats. It was the story about Kim Jong-un's haircut or whatever it was, that, they, that, that, that sort of captured the, the, the uh, audience's attention. And so it became increasingly sort of frustrating to say, you know, how, how can we really get this through uh, given the, the, the way that sort of our media operates. Um, an even more egregious example, and, and, and I just love this, uh, a author, Adam Johnson, wrote a very interesting book called The Orphan Master's Son, uh, which is set in North Korea, has, has North Korean figures. 
It's a work of magical realism, and you don't need to read very many pages before you discover that. Uh, it's a work that anyone that knows anything about Korea in general, North Korea in particular, can recognize that almost each, each and every page is filled with things that just simply don't fit, that aren't right, that, that don't match. Uh, it's obviously you know, work largely of, of, of the author's imagination. Uh, and he confessed this. He said, you know, I'm no expert in the political, military, and nuclear economic dimensions of North Korea. I went there once, I read some books, and then I wrote this really interesting novel. Uh, but the novel won the Pulitzer Prize. And so it got a lot of coverage and got a lot of reviews. And I found myself really just sort of scratching my head at the way that other people were describing this book as if it could really tell you anything about the real North Korea. Here's one example. The book opens a frightening window on the mysterious kingdom of North Korea. No, it doesn't. It's a work of magical realist fiction. Uh, the book, uh, Johnson, an American novelist whose research for the book took him to North Korea, does a superb job of conjuring the almost surreal physical peculiarities of the country. Uh, no, not really. Uh, I hope CIA analysts read literary fiction. I wonder if I hope they do. I don't know. <laughs> and Johnson, though initially you know, expressing his general ignorance about most things, uh, couldn't, like me, couldn't resist the siren song of, of becoming a North Korea expert. And, and before you know it, after all of this uh, media adulation and, and, and these claims that you, know, you really can learn about North Korea from reading this book, suddenly found himself opining about all sorts of things. Uh, for example, Will Kim Jong-un launch another missile? And it's his prediction, they're gonna send up a big ass rocket. And whatever happens, the North Koreans will call it a startling success. It's not about science, it's about the consolidation of power so Kim Jong-un doesn't get murdered in the night. Suddenly he's a North Korea expert, being interviewed on TV. Uh, as, as if being able to write a work of magical realist fiction tells you anything about North Korea. And so obviously here we need to be a little bit careful, a little bit skeptical. And note furthermore, Oh, oh, and it, just as an aside, if you're going to read fiction about North Korea, the Inspector O novels by James Church, that's a pseudonym for uh, a long-working uh, uh, intelligence official, they're much better reads. Uh, and so if you, if you want to go somewhere, that, that, that's the place to go. But sadly, even if you do have real expertise and, and you want to get your message out, the, the fact is, once it's filtered through our media, most of this is lost. The caveats are lost, the nuance is lost, the, the, the uncertainty is lost, and instead we get this very, these, these very lurid uh, caricatures of, of what North Korea is really like. And I want to very quickly run through just a, a, a laundry list of, of what I call media misapprehensions, things that are repeated over and over again in the media that don't actually track up very well with, with, with the reality, just to illustrate what, what I mean. One is, is that North Korea is the hermit kingdom, uh, that, it, that it's isolationist, it's xenophobic, it doesn't like to have relations with the outside world. This is repeated over and over again, and, and it's the cause for, you, you can pretty much predict with almost clock-like regularity that every three months or so, a major American news, whether it's a newspaper or magazine, will have the breathless report of a reporter that finally gets into the hermit kingdom of North Korea and is going to tell us what it really is, when in reality what this reporter does is go on the exact same tour that all of his predecessors have gone on for the last 20 years. They see the exact same set of monuments. They have the exact same interactions with their handlers. They don't tell us anything new at all. But this idea that North Korea is the hermit kingdom means that any access, at least by Americans, is regarded as interesting, as noteworthy, as, as, as worth uh, you know, paying attention to. Uh, what, what is the reality? Well, well if, we, if we look at the issue of normal diplomatic relations, the, 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 the nations that have embassies and ambassadors and, and, the, and the, the normal exchange of diplomatic relations according to Westphalian norms with North Korea, the nations in green are nations that have normal diplomatic relations with North Korea. The nations in red are nations that once upon a time did, but for whatever reasons have suspended them. The nations in gray are those that don't. Is North Korea a hermit kingdom? Only if we, re we redefine hermit to mean not having relations with the United States. Uh, the, you know, North Korea has robust relations with, with many, many other different nations. Uh, but for some reason, we think if they don't have relations with us, they must not like to have relations with anyone. Second misapprehension, North Korea is often described as a communist state. And, and to be sure, its origins can be found in the Soviet occupation of the Korean Peninsula after World War II. Uh, North Korea certainly was, uh, in many respects, cooperative with, with the Eastern Bloc, with the Soviet Union, with China, with, with Eastern Europe, and so on. Uh, and, and there are a, a handful of North Korea experts that come to the issue of North Korea from a very different approach than, than, than we do, uh, like my good friend Reutiger Frank, uh, who grew up in East Germany, and uh, while the Cold War was still going on, traveled to North Korea and studied, studied at Kim Il-sung University and, and learned you know, all about North Korea on the ground as, as a fellow member of the socialist bloc. And he will tell you that there are many, many aspects of North Korea, particularly its economy, that seem very similar to what he you know, experienced growing up in, in East Germany. Uh, and, and, and so to some extent, the, the communist moniker fits. 
But even Frank will tell you that uh, if it's less and less well as, as the years roll on, and that even early on, North Korea had some very interesting and very significant deviations from the communist norm that, that, that again, get completely lost. For example, on the seal of the Korean Workers' Party, in addition to the expected hammer and sickle representing the working class and, and the farmers, we have that thing in the middle, a writer's brush. Because in North Korea, authors, artists, intellectuals can be revolutionary, just as revolutionary as the oppressed working classes. And then a good North Korean fashion, not, let's not only put it on the seal of the Workers' Party, let's make huge monuments that, that, that depict the same sort of thing. Uh, but, but again, not very especially orthodox communists. Uh, the whole purpose of a socialist revolution is to overcome feudal class structure and, and, and make a, a classless society where, where, where things are held in common from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, uh, according to the old Marxist dictum. North Korea has legal hereditary classes. Uh, there are three big groups that outsiders call the core, the wavering, the hostile classes. Within each of these groups are several subdivisions, uh, as, as many as, as 55 or 65, depending on how you count. These are class divisions based on who your parents and grandparents were that's based entirely on heredity. Uh, this, is, this is about as anti-communist as you can get, uh, but, but it's about as Korean as you can get. Uh, very, very sort of traditional Korean uh, thinking of, of, of a society is broken up by hereditary classes. Uh, communists pride themselves of being forward-looking, progressive, scientific, and so therefore something like the hereditary succession of power from father to son is, is not something that communists would or should do. Uh, and yet North Korea has done it twice, uh, power passing from Kim Il-sung to Kim Jong-il and then to Kim Jong-un. Uh, and anyone from Reutiger Frank on will say, you know, this, 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 you know, this is not good communism. And, it, and if you want to, you know, go no further, go to what the North Koreans themselves said about this in as late as 1970, when you looked in the DPRK political dictionary under the term hereditary succession, it says a reactionary custom practice in exploitative societies. Not us. We're, we're modern, we're forward-looking, progressive, we're communist. And yet we've seen power pass from father to son twice. Um, again, we can only attach the name communist uh, to North Korea if we redefine the word to mean bad place we don't like. Uh, above and beyond that, it doesn't really tell us all that much about what's going on. Third big misapprehension, North Korea is on the verge of collapse. Uh, th this has been something that I've heard ever since I've started watching Korea in the late 80s. Uh, some people are, are bold enough to put it into predictions in print, like Nick Eberstadt in his 1999 book, The End of North Korea. Uh, others have been speculating about it before and after, uh, all, all the way up to today. Uh, and, and this expectation that North Korea is on its last legs, it's done for, it's, it's going to collapse at any time, has had a huge impact on, on critical moments in North Korea's relations with outside powers, especially the United States. Uh, for example, when Jimmy Carter and Kim Il-sung negotiated the beginnings of what became the agreed framework, this, this agreement by which North Korea would suspend its plutonium operations the, at the Yongbyon facility in return for shipments of heavy fuel oil and the outside world's construction of two light water reactors in North Korea, many people criticized this deal. What, what do you mean? Why are you giving North Korea all this stuff? You're giving them fuel, you're, you're constructing them uh, nuclear reactors, and then only after all this is done, then you say we'll start to talk about the permanent uh, destruction, dismantling of, of North Korea's nuclear weapons programs. You know, wh wh what's up with this? Well, the reality is those that negotiated the deal, especially those that followed up uh, on, on, on Carter's initial uh, forays, assumed that North Korea was on its last legs. It was done for. And so the idea is, well, this is a stopgap measure to keep the plutonium reprocessing from moving ahead. We'll start building these reactors, but we won't really have to finish them because by the time they're, they're even close to being done, North Korea will have collapsed, South Korea will have absorbed North Korea, and then if they want to finish the reactors, fine. But, but it's not really going to be our problem. It's not really going to be our issue. That was 1994. Here we are. Uh, you know, assuming that the collapse was any day, it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and uh, President Obama, in his famous or infamous YouTube interview, was asked about North Korea. And it's interesting how many of these tropes he has obviously internalized. Describing North Korea as the most isolated, the most sanctioned, the most cut off nation on earth. The, the kind of authoritarianism that exists there, you can't duplicate anywhere else. It's brutal, it's oppressive, and as a consequence, the country can't even really feed its own people. Over time, you will see a regime like this collapse. Now, of course, you should note these predictions someday will come true. No regime lasts forever. We'll always see a collapse at some point. Uh, it's also important to note that, that you know, th these are contingencies you should be planning for. And, and, and the US government has at least tentatively reached out to powers like South Korea and China and say, what are we going to do if there is a collapse? How are we going to manage this so we don't get loose nukes out, uh, out in the country and, and our various uh, militaries clashing in the middle of North Korea and things like that? Uh, th this is all well and good. But again, the expectation of a, of a collapse is old. You know, here's Robert Manning, 1993, talking about the potential futures of North Korea. And in his mind, the possibilities run the gamut from implosion and a collapse along the lines of Romania to explosion. And this is it. North Korea is done for, 1993. 
I remember sitting in this very room hearing from North Korean experts in about that same time, 1992 or 91, and people basically saying, sure, Kim Il-sung, he has legitimacy. He fought against the Japanese, and so the North Koreans respect him for that. He has a lot of personal charisma. The North Koreans like him for that. He's built up this huge cult of personality uh, that, that, that reinforces his centrality to the regime. But there's no way the regime can last beyond him. Once he dies, it's over. It's done for. And, you know, and I often joke, if I had a quarter for every time someone said, wait till Kim Il-sung dies, I could retire. Well, he died in 94. Then his son took over. And after a few uh, apparently rocky start, uh, he, he firmly established control. Then the narrative shifts. Well, yeah, he doesn't have the same legitimacy as his dad. He didn't fight against the Japanese, and he's kind of weird looking. He likes to make movies. But he had been groomed for 20 years to be the successor. He'd been prepared. The North Korean people were ready to accept this. And so wait till he dies. And then for sure, it's over. It's done with. That was 2011. Now we've got Kim Jong-un. Uh, that's not to say that a collapse might not happen. Uh, I, I think if you ask most of the, the sort of egghead academics about the stability or the durability of the Eastern Bloc in, say, 1987 or 1988, most of them would say, oh, it's fine. You know, the, the, we're, we're going to see this, this type of, of thing lasting for a long, long time. And then the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, but, but I would say that in general, this, this expectation that it's happening tomorrow, it's happening soon, it's imminent, uh, simply hasn't stood the test of time. And it's another case where we get things wrong. A handful of what I call smaller misapprehensions, ways in which the Western media just, just gets things wrong in, in ways that maybe just because I'm OCD bugs me, uh, but, but, but it's sort of an indication that, again, we don't necessarily see what's really going on. Here, here's one of my favorite ones. Lots of people are, are interested in the North Korean ballistic missile program uh, for various reasons. Uh, North Korea exports and sells these, shares the technology with other regimes that we don't like, and there is the fear that ultimately it will develop the capacity to actually put a nuclear weapon on top of one of these and, and send it somewhere we don't want it sent. Uh, and when they talk about them, uh, they, they usually talk about the first sort of home-produced uh, short-range missile here, the, the, the Nodong. Well, any, any good expert on Korea, especially North and South Korea, will, will immediately engage in some self-congratulatory back patting and say, well, you know, I know that the real name is not Nodong because that's a South Korean pronunciation, that the real name is Rodong because that's how they'd say it in North Korea. You know, here's the Hangul for it. Uh, but it actually goes deeper than this. What, what, what does Rodong mean? Where's the name come from? Anybody know? Okay, uh, uh, that, that, that's the usual explanation, that, that it's the word for laborer or worker, North Korea being supposedly a communist or socialist place. You know, they, they might name one of their missiles against, uh, 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 after one of the working class. And actually, if you look on Wikipedia, that's what it says. But you dig a little deeper, and uh, there are actually some Chinese characters that go with this particular Rodong. Does that mean worker? Sorry, it doesn't. What does it mean? It's the location of the place where the first example of this missile was launched in the northwest coast of North Korea. Uh, and uh, since then, the United States, in particular the U.S. government, U.S. intelligence, has, has insisted on calling these missiles the, the Nodong because, because of, of the location of this place. Never mind that the actual North Korean name isn't Nodong or Rodong at all. It's Hwasong. Um, why we insist on doing this, I have no idea. But, but we, we sort of insist on saying, you know, we, even if we know what the real name is, we're not going to call it this. Uh, who, who can explain it? And you can do the same thing with the next multi-stage rocket, the Tepodong. What, what, what does Tepodong mean? Again, we can do some sort of reverse etymology, but it could mean large cannon uh, rocket. You know, that kind of makes sense. It's this sort of militaristic uh, image. Sorry, it's the, the same thing. It's the location where the, the rocket was first tested. Uh, and again, it's not the name the North Koreans use. The North Koreans use the name Bektusan, the name of their holy mountains. Um, if we can't get these details right, I have to start wondering about everything else. Uh, what, you know, what, what are we really seeing? What are we really knowing about North Korea? A few other examples. Uh, I have often said, and here's, here's a case where I'm complicit, that you know, North Koreans are so nationalistic that they, that, that they have tried to purge their language of any foreign influences. Uh, and so therefore, naturally, they're not going to use any English loan words, as, as are often used in South Korea. But, but they've also purged their, their language of Chinese characters. The North Koreans no longer know the Chinese characters that are at the root of, of a huge number of, of their words, something like 60%. How, how many of you have heard this before? Am I the only one? OK, a few of you. Um, this would be a shock and a surprise to North Koreans that have to slog through these textbooks that teach them Chinese characters. And here's a junior high school one published in the year Juche 91. Now, the Juche calendar starts in 1912 when Kim Il-sung was born, so let's do the math. That's 2003, not that long ago. And you can actually find numerous statements by the three great North Korean leaders, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un, all saying, we need to learn Hanja. We need, we, need to study, we need to study these characters. It's still an important part of our uh, education. Um, 
Recent news report from a year or two ago uh, said that uh, Kim Jong-un has is, is, uh, become very enamored of Hitler and the Nazis, so much so that he's giving copies of Mein Kampf to his top leaders and saying you need to, to learn from this. Uh, this came from a, a website run by North Korean defectors in South Korea, and, and uh, there's just you know, zero corroborating evidence, and, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why this wouldn't be the case, not least that, that uh, North Korea's long association with the Soviet Union would, would give them a, a sort of intrinsic anti-Nazi bias, not least because for decades the only movies that North Koreans saw that weren't produced in North Korea came from the Soviet Union, and any of those war movies are not going to pick the Nazis in a good light. Uh, the, the, there's simply no reason other than in our expectations, well, North Korea is a really bad place, and all bad places end up being Nazis. Uh, the, the, no, no sort of other reason why we, why we would come to this conclusion. But yet, the defectors' website uh, ran with this, and, and it made any number of, of Western news accounts as, as, as fact, as unchallenged fact. Uh, along those lines, there was another one recently that said, you know, oh, the, the silly North Koreans, they believe in unicorns. They said they just found a unicorn lair. Uh, the reality was they, they, they claimed they found a tomb of one of the ancient uh, Korean kingdoms, Koguryo, that was called the unicorn lair because that's what they called it. They were making no claim whatsoever that we believe that unicorns are real or we found a cave where they used to exist or anything like that. But again, we on the outside don't take them for being real rational human beings. And we say, well, of course they believe in unicorns. They're North Koreans. What do we expect? Uh, we all heard the story about uh, Kim Jong-un's famous uncle, John sung Tech, who many thought was the real power behind the throne, really wielding power when, when Kim Jong-un over, took over. And then Kim Jong-un very uh, quickly sort of uh, removed that, uh, disabused of, the, of that notion by having him arrested and executed and airbrushed out of photos and you know, all the rest that, that we sort of come to expect. Uh, but here, too, there were all sorts of salacious uh, news accounts uh, about the, the method of his execution. I mean, it wasn't enough just to kill him. It, they stripped him naked and fed him to hungry dogs. Uh, this came from a satirical Chinese website uh, that, that was openly satire. But ultimately, another Chinese newspaper, the Singapore Straits Times, picked it up, and then it, then it went global. And, and people across the world are, are, are being told that, that Kim Jong-un, or not Kim Jong-un, uh, John sung Tech. Was, was fed to the dogs. That's how they, they execute people in, in today's North Korea. And if not that, there are other lurid tales of pe people being executed by flamethrower, mortar, and all sorts of other things that, that, that again, have no sort of uh, corroboration. So much so that one American reporter said in a moment of candor, you can write almost anything about North Korea, and people will just accept it. You know, that we sort of suspend our disbelief and, and say, well, you know, it's, it's North Korea. Uh, the, the, you know, what, what else will, will we expect? I will note that this is not unique to reporting on North Korea. That we, the, the further away the people are, the more we tend to believe strange outlandish things about them. Here's a, an interesting case from China, where there was this huge video in, uh, in Beijing uh, and showing a sunrise. And so the, 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 the news account said, you know, the Chinese air quality is so bad that, that, that the Chinese government has taken to simulating sunrises to, to sort of convince its people that things are OK. Uh, the reality was that this is just a, a, a uh, travel promotion for, for Shandong province saying, come to Shandong. And it had all sorts of different scenes, you know, of sun rising and water and mountains and all the other things. And it was no way trying to say, you know, hey, you stupid Chinese, this is the real sunrise. Don't, don't, don't be uh, distracted by, by the dirty air. But, but again, none of this, none of this nuance is, is, is captured. And it's just, that, well, of course, that, that's what we expect. This, this is China. Uh, or in the case of Japan, any, any sort of weird thing that comes out of Japan, we sort of accept as, as, as being you know, widely practiced in Japan, uh, the, the, the bagel face being one where you inject your forehead with stuff and make a bagel shape. Uh, this is actually less than half a dozen people on one outlandish television program that the vast majority of even Japanese have no idea about, and yet it was circulated around as, as you know, this is what's going on in Japan. This is what Japanese people are doing. Uh, and note, there's not only Westerners that do this. Uh, others uh, fall victim to uh, the Chinese, uh, some Chinese media. Uh, took a, a story in The Onion about how the U.S. Congress is going to demand uh, to be relocated. They're going to leave D.C. unless they got a new Capitol building with a retractable dome. Uh, and, and a few uh, Chinese uh, uh, newspapers ran this as a straight-up story. You know, here, here's an indication of what's going on in American politics these days. You know, Congress is fed up and, and, and they want a new dome. Uh, other Chinese media also reported another interesting thing from, from The Onion that sort of brings us around full circle. Uh, the Onion in, in, a couple of years ago declared Kim Jong-un as the sexiest man alive. And again, the, the Chinese newspapers, in many respects, re reported this straight up. You know, the, the, you know the, this is what the Americans think. They, they really like this guy. Uh, and, and, and so it goes. OK, what does this say about the, 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 the two things that have occupied the attention of late? Uh, the, the Sony hacking scandal. Uh, very quick bit of background. November 24, 2014, uh, Sony was hacked. And, and, and uh, many employees saw this screen that, that told them they were being hacked and that, that their emails and movies and other things were going to be distributed widely and so on. Uh, and, and naturally, it made a lot of, of uh, news here, not least because some of the emails were rather incriminating or embarrassing for, for the, uh, the Sony officials that, that said them. 
Uh, but it's interesting to note that they, these initial hacking uh, manifestos, if you will, uh, said nothing about North Korea, said nothing about the, the uh, controversial movie, the interview, uh, any of that. That was actually 22 days later, only after various elements of the American media were speculating, I wonder if this hacking is done by the North Koreans who surely wouldn't like this movie called The Interview because it, it depicts them in a bad light and it depicts their leader Kim Jong-un being assassinated and so on. Uh, and then, after uh, the, these media reports, then, then they sort of picked up the, hey, you should stop the distribution of the, of, of the interview, and, and there'll be terrible things that'll happen, like 9-11 like all over again if, if it happens and so on. Um, uh, and very quickly, uh, just a couple days after that, the FBI declared in no uncertain terms, we know the North Koreans did it. Uh, since then, there's been any number of critiques of, of the types of evidence that the FBI has brought forth, saying, uh, you know, people from the cybersecurity community and others saying, you know, some of this doesn't make sense, some of this is, 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 is making sort of logical leaps that shouldn't be made and so on. Uh, but, but generally, the U.S. government has doubled down, and, and among other things, the NSA has come out and said, oh, by the way, we had penetrated North Korean uh, uh, systems and, and long before this happened, and so, so we know for sure. And some cybersecurity companies like CrowdStrike side with the government. Others, like North Security, say, no, it's, it, you know, there's no real proof that it's North Korea. Others do interesting things like analyze the, the misspellings and grammatical errors in the manifestos and say, you know, which, which other language were you most likely to have spoken to make this particular type of error and come to the conclusion that actually Russian is a more likely candidate than, 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 than Korean and on and on. You know, the, the fact of the matter is we don't know. Uh, one way or another, and a lot of it depends on which source you trust or which narrative you trust. But I am sort of struck by a couple of observations that were made about all of this that I think speak to this sort of deeper issues, deeper problem, deeper truth. One was made by a North Korean expert, Robert Kelly, uh, who starts up by saying, I, you know, I, I, I trust the government on this one simply because the FBI director and the president have been so emphatic that it was Pyongyang. But then he adds, I bet they were thinking that even if North Korea was not guilty of this, there are a lot of other good reasons to sanction North Korea, which is true even if it is sloppy reasoning. You know, it doesn't really matter all that much because we all know already that North Korea is a bad place, deserving of whatever punishment we see fit to inflict upon them. Whether this is the particular you know, actual cause or not, yeah, that, that doesn't really matter all that much at the end of the day. Uh, and then I was also struck by, by this uh, British academic who, who uh, made the interesting observation that the U.S. might not necessarily impose sanctions on another country. After all, both China and Russia have conducted serious cyber espionage and exploitation attacks on the U.S. already, both government and private, and these have officially only been met with diplomatic protest. Uh, the idea is, well, in part, the sanctions that were put on North Korea after the allegations of North Korea's complicity in the hacking were in part done because we can, without any, any real fear of, of major repercussion that we might get if we were to try to impose the same set of sanctions on, say, uh, Russia, uh, Russia or, or, or China. Uh, and would note that, that uh, after uh, President Obama promised a proportional response, uh, many observers noted that for a couple of days the entire North Korean internet appeared to go down. And there was a lot of uh, commentary on that in, in the American media, ha ha, you know, now, now they know what it's like. Uh, but, but no sort of uh, stepping back and making any sort of moral judgment, oh, wait a minute, if, if, if it's wrong for North Korea to hack into the United States, why is it necessarily proportional or proper for the U.S. to, to return the favor? You know, no, no sort of speculation on that at all. The other one that's, that's been in, in uh, the news of a lot of late is, is uh, the perils and promises of using defectors as sources. Uh, people have been defecting from North Korea ever since there was a North Korea, but the, the rate has gone up pretty dramatically in the last 15 years, uh, where, where you have, in, in most years, at least 1,000, in some cases more than 2,000 people, leaving North Korea for good, and in most cases ending up at least initially in South Korea, though, though some move on to other places since then. Uh, and naturally, some of these people want to tell their stories about what happened to them, about what North Korea was like, and, and, and they are therefore a very uh, interesting and potentially useful source to figure this out. Uh, the routes that they have to take now are incredible because the, the, the PRC has beefed up the security so much around all of the diplomatic compounds in Beijing and other places. They actually have to go all the way through China and end up in a third country like Mongolia or Thailand or Cambodia to, to be able to formally defect. It's not an easy thing, uh, and, and uh, you know, many, many don't make it this far. But of those that do, they do provide us some interesting insights, uh, to some degree at least, about what, what's going on in North Korea. And, and, and using defectors as, as a window into North Korea is, is nothing new. Uh, Longtime American intelligence official Helen Louise Hunter interviewed uh, dozens of North Korean defectors uh, decades ago and came up with a very detailed report about North Korean politics and society based on this that was classified for a long time and then finally declassified and, and forms the, the, the core of her book. Kim Il-sung's North Korea, and it tells us a lot of interesting things about North Korea in the 60s and 70s, maybe in the early 80s. Uh, and then we've had more recent uh, defector testimony. One of the most significant is, is uh, Gang Chol Hwan, who told his story of being in a North Korean prison camp, and then finally being able to, after being released from the camp, being able to escape North Korea and tell the story of the rest of the world in his book of the Aquariums of Pyongyang, which as far as we know is the only book about North Korea that George W. Bush has claimed to have read, 
Uh, he, he was spotted holding it a few times, and he actually invited Kong to the White House and met with him, and has openly said, this book has shaped my understanding of North Korea and, and why it's such a big problem. You know, th th this, is, this has helped me understand what's going on. Uh, since then, there's been a veritable flood of other defectors telling their stories, and there are, there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of, of different accounts of, of, of people that have, have fled. Uh, and, and many of them tell uh, similar stories, some, some of them tell uh, uh, different ones. Uh, but there's an interesting dynamic going on here that, that, that we're not sort of fully cognizant of in many respects. And that is, many of these defectors uh, express extreme relief, euphoria, when they finally, after this arduous journey, make it to South Korea. You know, I've, I've made it to my goal. I've, I've fled my oppressive country. I'm now in this new place. Then they discover, after not too long, that actually life in South Korea is pretty hard that uh, they speak almost a different language, they have different cultural mores, uh, they have a great difficulty in assimilating, finding jobs, getting good educational opportunities, uh, and, and uh, studies of the defector community in South Korea find much higher rates of alcoholism, depression, suicide, unemployment than the general population in South Korea. And many of them complain that there really only are a few sort of permitted avenues that North Koreans are allowed to, to, to prosper in and do in South Korea. One of them, interestingly, is to open up restaurants where they serve North Korean variants of Korean food like Pyongyang Naemyeon. And, and there, there are a number of these scattered around South Korea, and especially when they first opened up, very popular, very successful. Uh, but interestingly, one other sort of acceptable career alternative for North Korean defectors in South Korea is to be a North Korean, to be a defector, to be an activist, to tell the story of North Korea to anyone that wants to hear, and to agitate for change and for more attention uh, paid to human rights and so on. But here, there's this interesting dynamic that each defector now finds him or herself competing with other defectors for media attention. Uh, and and you know, what, what story can I tell that will get the attention on me rather than, than you know, the, the next defector? Because there are, there are 20,000 of these in, in, in South Korea. Uh, and then the North Korean defector community as a whole is competing with other oppressed groups across the world for international attention. You know, pay attention to North Korean human rights as opposed to human rights in Afghanistan or Zimbabwe or somewhere else. And sadly, it appears that there has been a tendency, therefore, to sort of ratchet up. We, we, we've got to tell more dramatic stories. We've got, to, we've got to make this story really, really have some pops and punch if anyone's going to pay any attention to us. And that's where we get uh, the, the interesting case of, of Shin Dong-hyuk, a, uh, a defector who fled North Korea, uh, told a story with the help of Blaine Harden, a Washington Post reporter, about his escape from Camp 14. This, this, this is one of the camps that, in theory at least, if you're in there, you're never going to leave. You're going to work there until you die. He, he said he was born in this camp, and that was the only life he knew. And, then only, and, and that he was repeatedly tortured uh, through his, his uh, childhood and his young adulthood, uh, and, and you know, has the scars to prove it. Uh, and then he had this very dramatic escape, first from the camp, and then ultimately from North Korea. And then he spent the rest of his life uh, you know, traveling around the world, telling his story, and highlighting the plight of, of, of North Korea uh, uh, to, to anyone that will listen. Well, interestingly, when the UN Commission on North Korean Human Rights was putting together their report, they very clearly said, you know, this guy's story is the one that we're going to lead with. Uh, the, in some of the testimony, he was described as witness number one. Another uh, UN Commission official described him as the single strongest voice on the atrocities inside the North Korean camps. Then things get murky. Oh, and, and, and you know, if, if Bush has Kong Cho Hwang come to the White House, uh, John Kerry meets with, with Shin dong hyuk Then things get murky because the North Koreans release a video of Shin's father who Sheen said was dead. And he said, not only am I alive, but uh, we didn't live in that camp. Uh, we lived across the river. And uh, the injuries that he claims were the result of torture are, are the result of childhood accidents and workplace injuries. And, and, and he disputed all sorts of other aspects of, of, of Sheen's stories. And you know, the story he's telling you is not the real story. Now, my first reaction when I learned this was, well, you know, this is North Korea, of course. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll bring up someone. Uh, that'll make these claims, but Sheen will say, well, you know, it's just North Korean propaganda, he's being forced to say this, uh, you know, dismiss this, don't pay any attention. What Sheen actually said is, oops, my bad, uh, you're right, I didn't tell you the right story. Um, I didn't live in Camp 14 for much of my life. Uh, I actually escaped twice to China and was caught and sent back, and, and actually most of my injuries were from post-escape and re-detention torture rather than just sort of random things as, as, as a child or as, as a young adult. And oh, I guess my father really is alive. Uh, sorry, uh, my bad. Um, didn't, didn't really tell you that story right. Um, naturally, uh, people like Blaine Harden, the, you know, the, the journalist that, that's really worked to publicize uh, Sheen's uh, story, has, has had to say, okay, what do we do now? Uh, and he's written a new foreword to, 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 to the book in which, among other things, he said, Sheen has told me he is now determined to tell the truth, but regrettably he's told me this before. It seems prudent to expect more revisions. 
Uh, another North Korean defector, Kim Hye Suk, uh, expressed his, her anger. He gave the North Koreans an excuse to say, we are all liars, deny its human rights abuses. Now when I come forward with my story, someone might be suspicious of me. I have to watch my back. Uh, she's absolutely right. Even if what she's saying is absolutely 100% true, now we have to be more skeptical than we were before. And then what happens to the UN Commission that, that had Sheen as, as witness number one as the single strongest voice for the atrocities? Uh, there's a little backtracking here where Michael Kirby, the head of the report, said, well, you know, there, there are other testimony too. Don't, don't, don't pay too much attention to Sheen, even though that's exactly what we did until these, these revelations came forward. Uh, feeling blood in the water, the North Koreans then turned to another high-profile, very telegenic, uh, uh, appealing uh, character, uh, Yunmi Park. Uh, same sort of thing, saying, you know, here, here are some reasons why her account should be doubted, and here too she, she basically says, uh, yeah, you're kind of right, uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, my life wasn't quite so bad in North Korea as I depicted, and, and the specific details of this and that weren't worth the same, and so on. Uh, and, and, and away we go. Uh, one, uh, an American reporter that, that worked on the Yummy Pak story uh, concludes this way, and I think she's right on. If someone with such a high profile twists their story to fit the narrative that we have come to expect from North Korean defectors, our perspective of the country could become dangerously skewed. We need to have a full and truthful picture of life in North Korea if we are to help those living under its abysmally cruel regime and those who try to flee. Uh, but sadly, this effort has been undermined by the very people that were telling the stories uh, for, for, for a variety of reasons. All right, really quickly, out of time, but, but I, I just want to conclude with, with what I will confess to be a sort of provocative plea to say that if we want to make sense of North Korea, the first step is to not consider North Korea to be that different. Let, let's consider ways in which North Korea is sort of normal. And by normal, I don't mean acceptable. I don't mean right. I don't mean good. But I just mean not beyond the realm of what normally happens in, in human societies. And just really quickly, a couple of examples. If, if we focus then on similarities rather than differences, uh, we, we can focus on the fact that the vast majority of people who have left North Korea don't really fit the profile of defector fleeing political repression. They fit the profile of someone wanting a better life, uh, wanting, wanting to, to, to get a better job, to earn more money, to have a better life. Uh, and by some estimates, 70, 75 percent of, of North Korean defectors are like this. Now, naturally, if they tell that story, no one's going to listen to them. No one wants to hear that story. No one cares. But if we, if we think about that, and then we consider the ways in which our own debates about illegal immigration and about the, you know, the, the, the acceptable motives and the unacceptable motives for migration and so on, then, then we can recognize that there, there are some transnational issues here that transcend any particular uh, uh, specific national domain. Same, sadly, I think is true for the Gulag system. Uh, that, that, that on the one hand, you know, 200,000 people uh, captured here in, in, in terrible, abysmal conditions. On the other hand, um, you can look at the expanding American prison system and recognize the fact that the United States actually incarcerates more, a higher percentage of its own population than North Korea does. And while no one would say that the conditions in American prisons approach the stories told by Shin Dong Hyuk and others about North Korean prisons, I wouldn't wish the conditions on uh, prisoners in most uh, US prisons on my worst enemy. Uh, not least the, 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 the much higher than average uh, precedent of rape. Uh, and, and, and so again, rather than saying North Korea is this unique thing that, that we should uniquely focus on is uniquely bad, just ask ourselves, why do states need to, or think they need to incarcerate so many of their own citizens? Uh, and, and, and what are maybe the underlying causes of this and, and, and what, what, what can we do about it? Um, the North Korean economy has collapsed since the early 90s and, and has been struggling ever since. And, and uh, much talk about the grinding poverty and so on, and much of this is laid at the doorstep, and probably rightly so, of, of, of the leadership and of the political system. You know, this is because of this particular uh, political system this is happening. And yet, we can look at the collapse of Detroit, and yet I see very few people saying this is, this is an overall indictment of the American free, uh, free market economic system. Uh, and I think you can look at the two and say there are actually some similarities here. These are both Rust Belt economies that had a really difficult time making the transition to when the global economy went towards information technology and services. And, and uh, again, maybe there are things that, that, that we share more in common than, than, than we'd like to think. Uh, and then finally, I, I don't want to sound, and I'm sure I do sound, like a North Korean apologist here. I'm not making moral equivalents. I'm not saying that they were, they were exactly the same. Uh, but I will note that there are plenty of other places in the world uh, that also have abysmal human rights records. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia, which flogs bloggers that say things that the government doesn't like, which doesn't allow women to drive in public, but they're more than happy to, be, to behead women in public, uh, whose uh, members of, of the Saudi royal family have openly supported al-Qaeda and other, other terrorist groups that are obviously you know, trying to kill Americans and others, and whose core economic strategy right now is to flood the market with cheap oil in order to strangle a promising nascent uh, American industry, that of, that of shale oil. You know, the Saudis do many things which we would say are deplorable, that aren't uh, the, the actions of a friend of the United States, and yet, um, I'm going to say, well, let, let me say this really quick. Hereditary succession, we say it's weird. How could the North Koreans really think Kim Jong-un is a legitimate leader? 
how can we think the Kennedys, third generations, are legitimate? Um, how can out of 350 million people, we might be looking at the wife of one president and the son and the brother of another as our two key presidential candidates? Maybe there's something more to this idea of hereditary succession than, than, than we think that, that transcends. Uh, but but the, Saudi Arabia, you know, President Bush holds hands with, with uh, Saudi princes. Barack and Michelle Obama go to the funeral of the, of the, of the Saudi king. We don't say, therefore, we love Saudi Arabia and we love everything that goes on, but we can treat Saudi Arabia like a normal place, a place that we can have interactions with, we can have relations with, and, and then we can move forward from there. And, and, and be sort of my plea to try to do that same thing with North Korea. Uh, and if we do that, we might not get it quite as wrong uh, so many times in the future. Okay, that's all I've got. Sure. So we know many of you will have to go to classes, but if you would like to ask a few questions, we'll take a couple of minutes. Please line up at the queue. Tell us your name and what you're studying. And uh, we'll just go for a couple more minutes if there are questions. Please. First one's always the hardest. <laughs> Jordan will do. Hi, my name is Jordan Routh. I'm studying uh, Asian studies here. Um, my question is reflective of the domestic political situation in South Korea and in the likelihood that a more progressive candidate takes the next election, do you think a, what effect do you think another version of a sunshine policy will have in North Korea? That's a very good question. Um, short answer is, is, is like everything about North Korea, we don't know, right? Yeah. Uh, but but, but uh, my, my stab at it would be, I, I think it certainly is likely that a more progressive South Korean government would try to engage North Korea more than the last two more conservative administrations have. Uh, and I think that it's very likely that in doing so, they would come up with the same sort of challenges that the previous uh, proponents of sunshine and engagement went up with, which is the, the very asymmetrical way that this engagement actually works, where, where North Korea demands and receives all sorts of things, but doesn't really reciprocate all that much. And the question is, is that enough to try to bring about meaningful change in North Korea? And the answer is, I mean, is there, is there a better policy? I don't know. Uh, but but the, the track record of sunshine in the past has not been particularly good in that, in, in that particular respect. Okay. And I have a... The, your analogy for Saudi Arabia and North Korea also having, does Saudi Arabia have a similar um, loose nuclear weapon policy or that kind of nuclear threat? Uh, the, the, as far as I understand, and this is way out of my area of expertise, but since I'm more than good at playing experts on TV, I'll, I'll, I'll give okay. that a check. Uh, that, that the United States has been pretty firm in saying we will help guarantee your security and, and in return for that you don't pursue your own indigenous nuclear weapons program. You know, that, that's been the, the essential American policy towards Saudi nukes. Um, whether that policy will continue depends a, a lot about the security situation in, in, okay. in the Middle East. But, but, but right now, Saudi Arabia has, has been pretty open about, you know, yeah, sure, nukes might be nice, but right now we're not going to do them. Okay. So, so, so in that respect, it is a little different. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gentry Carter. I'm a public relations major. I feel like international relations and international engagement is very beneficial in helping, like, countries kind of, you know, stop some of their human rights abuses or like, you know, help the track record and generally help like the national economy. So if North Korea is being so engaging with everyone except for the US, what instances are we seeing in them like increasing better, not necessarily just not being communistic mm -hmm. in the past few years? Uh I think the short answer is to be we've seen very little evidence, which is an interesting question. Uh, I mean, you, you do see economic interactions between North Korea and other parts of the world. You have an Egyptian telecommunications company that got the cell phone contract for all new North Korean cell phones. And one of the, the uh, reasons why they're able to do that is they finally completed the Yugyong Hotel, this giant hotel that was left uncompleted for, for, for two decades. Uh, but even though North Koreans now, a million of them have cell phones and, and they've had this interaction with the outside world, we don't see a lot of evidence of a change on the human rights front. Uh, there's an interesting book by a Swiss entrepreneur uh, where, where he said, you know, I've, I've been in North Korea for the past 10 years training North Koreans to, to, to run businesses and things like that. Uh, and so you see signs of changes in terms of, of, of sort of economic behavior, but you haven't seen a lot of corresponding changes in, in, in positions on human rights yet. Uh, the hope, of course, is if you get enough of this, then, then maybe those other changes will happen. But, but so far, not, not many signs of it. All right. And do you, uh, as a brief follow-up, do you think that that's just us not seeing them? Like, do you think that's respective of our, our perspective? Or do you think that's actually, like, there's not much going on yeah, yet, but it will be? That's a really good question. I, I, I think in some respects, uh, post-'94, 
uh, even up to today, the North Korean state in some respects has been less intrusive in the lives of its citizens. But that's not so much because of conscious desire to change. It's more a result of lack of state capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and beyond that, we haven't seen a lot of evidence. Okay. So. Um, and sorry, I have one more follow-up no question. So, um, like, in regards to the changes that are happening and we're seeing signs of, like, the times of them, like, having this change, um, do you think that they just need to kind of, like, keep on track or do you think there has to be, like, necessarily a political catalyst to change? I mean, there are, there are a number, the experts say there are a number of different potential scenarios for North Korea's future. Uh, the one that many sort of return to is this sort of muddling through scenario, that, mm -hmm. that, that the regime will continue, and, and, and many know it, I think, with good reason, that even if Kim Jong-un were die, to die tomorrow, whatever replaces him wouldn't necessarily be any better in terms of human rights and, and, and openness and so on. Uh, but, but the hope is, and, and this is, in my mind, one of the big questions for the 21st century is, is, is there an inherent intrinsic link between economic progress and, and, and the raising of standards of living and therefore the demand of people for political change. Uh, many of us would like to think so. Uh, China is making a good bid to say there's a different way of thinking about this. Yeah. Uh, and so what we see happen in North Korea and China, I think will, will, will in the end demonstrate whether there is a link and whether it is enough to simply wait for economic progress to, to, to pave the way for political change or whether you really do need something more revolutionary to, to, to affect that change. Okay, and thank we, you. We, and we just don't know. My name is E.J. Yu, and I'm a history major. Um, I have a question. You made a plea at the end of your presentation that we need to change our perception of North Korea as you know, more than just all of this bad, all these bad, all these bad things that we kind of make make them out to be in the media. Um, what do you believe is the next big step in? I mean, beyond changing our perception, public perception of North Korea, what is the next big step in helping them or? pursuing some kind of constructive I mean, it's solution. a very good question, and it's a difficult question for, for the United States government because we have backed ourselves into a corner. We have said, and this is a bipartisan issue, it doesn't matter whether it's Bush or Obama, we, we have said repeatedly we are not going to reward bad behavior. North Korea has done a bunch of bad behavior, so therefore we can't do anything that looks like engagement because that will be perceived as appeasement and rewarding bad behavior. So it's, so it's a hard thing because you say even if you think engagement might be a good idea, uh, doing it would, would uh, come at a high political price because we, we, we've told ourselves in a way that we don't say about the Saudis. You know, we never say, okay, if you do this one more time, you know, we're, we're going to impose sanctions on you or, or what have you. But we have about the North Koreans, so, so we're, we're uh, in part a product of our own stated policies. Uh, there's no obvious solution. There's a bunch of bad options, and the question is which one's least, least bad. I actually would be in favor, uh, and I'm you know, in the minority here, I'm in favor of doing to North Korea what we just did to Cuba. Just say, you know what, this, this is a relic of the Cold War. Let's just treat you like a normal country. Not a country that we love, not an ally, not a friend, but just treat you like a normal country, have normal diplomatic relations, and allow for more extensive interaction, and just see what happens. Uh, but I'm, I'm no expectation this will really happen anytime soon. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Buse, and I'm a political science major. And I was wondering, um, you know, with North Korea maintaining diplomatic relations with, you know, so many countries, as you were saying, and then on the other hand, America maintaining relations with countries that, like you said, it doesn't exactly agree with, what would you say is the main reason for such a decisive rift between North Korea and the United States? Uh, the, the fact that we fought a war. Uh, the fact that we're on opposite sides of the Cold War divide and the fact that uh, unlike places like India and Pakistan that were developing nuclear weapons where we said, you know, that's not a good idea, but we, d we didn't draw the same sorts of red lines with them as we did with North Korea. And, and so, so again, we're sort of stuck with our own, we, we said this, you know, if, if you develop nuclear weapons, you are not going to be allowed to be a normal country. And until you say you're going to get rid of your nuclear weapons, we won't even talk to you. Um, and then we're stuck. And, and that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm back. So I was really intrigued to your answer, not to this last question, but the one before, specifically on like um, policy changes that need to happen. Do you think it's going to be like more uh, decisive or more decisive or more important for like individual citizens to get involved and like kind of change like the social image of North Korea? Or do you think it's going to require policy change to impact I, I mean, I, I think both can help. I, 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 by no means, an expert on this, but I think you can argue that the change in policy towards Cuba was was able to come about in part because of the passing of the mm -hmm. previous generation of very fiercely anti-Castro Cuban immigrants to to the United States. And so, I, I think if you get 
grassroots change in, in public attitudes around North Korea, that, that could help. But it is, at least in the near-term future, going to take very decisive political action on the part of leaders to say, okay, all that stuff we said before, we don't really mean it. We're going to change. Okay. And that's hard. Thanks for your questions. And join me one more time in thanking Professor Larson. Thank you all.